are a community-based nonprofit organization and we work throughout the entire Upper Peninsula because our vision is we want all UP youth to be able to thrive and transition into successful adults. In order to do that, we feel an effective nonprofit sector is a critical component, and so the way we help create successful uh, youth is through creating strong communities. And so with our mission, creating strong community is looking out for the nonprofit and the youth serving sectors. And we do things such as training like this and consulting and board training and strategic planning and whatever nonprofits may need to help them be able to have a strong community. Today we are talking about conducting business in most all meetings uh, across the nation and in any state you go to will most likely follow some type of Robert's Rules of Order. And some of these statements may be familiar to you or you may feel like those pictures where, <coughs> excuse me, you're having difficulty just getting through a meeting because the chair um, is not effective or the meeting as a, the members of the meeting as a whole are not really using Robert's Rules of Order and it can get very chaotic. So who is this Robert and why are his rules the ones that we abide by? They are, um, actually it was General Henry Martin Robert and he created Robert's Rules of Order in 1876 after uh, he noticed that each of the colonies had separate ways of conducting business and more and more society organizations were forming and they had different ways and when they would all come together in assemblies it was very confusing so he took the rules of Parliament very sim from the British and also in the ways that the US Congress conducted business and he created these predetermined set of rules in how you conduct business it allows for effective meetings to be and business to be conducted in a fair manner. I want to warn you we're going through a lot of information today in a short amount of time and it's a lot like the English language in that it's somewhat difficult to know where to start and how to break it down. I'm assuming that you have some meeting experience so I don't want to break it down as far as what the ABCs are. Uh, however, I also don't want to go too deep that it just causes confusion and frustration. Another way this is like the English language is that the rules don't always make sense and some of the terminology may not make sense, but it allows everyone to communicate. So what's the purpose for Robert's Rules of Order? Uh, one, the purpose or the intent is to be able to focus on one thing at a time. Um, and to not have more than one issue at a time be discussed and to not have more than one person at a time to speak. Uh, you want to make sure again you extend courtesy to everyone and that all members are equal, all members have a chance to participate. And you observe the rule of the majority that no group decision is granted without at least a majority uh, voting and that you also ensure the rights of the minority so that all members have equal access to decision making and all members feel like their voice has been heard. Some of the common terms you may find um, are bylaws. Bylaws are your organizational operating documents and how the board will conduct business. So your bylaws supersede anything that we talk about today, especially if you're from a government agency or a school board or another uh, organization that falls under the Open Meetings Act. Your Some of the things that we talk about today, it may be a little different. And even other nonprofit organizations, you may have a different way of how you do things based on your bylaws. So you always want to read refer to your bylaws first. Um, an agenda. A meeting should always have an agenda which lists proposed items of business. And quorum. You want to make sure that you have a quorum 
and again that's usually listed in your bylaws usually it is a majority of the members if you don't have this quorum which is the minimum number of members to be able to conduct your business then you can't conduct business uh, we had a board member or excuse me a board meeting one time that was not it we were not able to have a quorum so we could discuss items but we could not vote on them then you have your chair, which is the person presiding over the meeting. A motion, which can also be referred to as a question, is the actual item of business, bringing forth an item of business. Um, then you vote, which is how people express their opinions. Um, you can abstain, and this is most often used to avoid conflicts of interest. So if there's a vote, or excuse me, if there's a motion on the table that says, let's say, you're voting to uh, build a new playground and your children go to that school and you want the new playground. You have a conflict of interest there because your children go to school there, so you should abstain from that vote. Um, carried or passes, that's what the moderator will say or the chair will say. Um, usually the motion passes or the motion is carried um, or on the flip side, it is denied or it fails. And then there's also an executive session, and that is where members of the board can go into closed session and all staff and other people, uh, public attendees that are not members of the board are asked to leave. So jumping right in to conduct business. First, a motion is made. Again, that's how you bring an item of business forward. And in order to do that, you say, um, I move. Or um, if the chair has entertained the intended motion, let's say your chair or your president has said, I entertain a motion to approve the minutes as read or as presented. Then someone can say, so move. And it's understood that okay you made the motion to uh, approve the minutes as presented sometimes people get confused when the chair will say I entertain a motion thinking that the chair is making the motion a chair cannot make a motion so some other member would need to make the motion and then you would need a second or support is what uh, is what is said and then you most of the motions are up for debate and so the chair facilitates one person speaking at a time chairs to maintain order and the chair must allow all people to speak unless someone calls previous question where we'll get into later or a time limit has already been voted on to limit debate and you've met that time limit uh, note, not all motions are debatable, and we will get into that as well. Once debate has concluded, then the motion is voted. And I want to say this quickly about debate, is that the chair is responsible to make sure that all people are able to have their voice heard, again, unless previous question or you limit debate ahead of time. Part of Robert's Rules of Order and Parliamentary Procedure is, again, making sure all voices are heard. So you don't want to cut anyone off. And the chair can simply say any other debate, and if no one says anything, then call it for a vote. Uh, usually it's a majority that carries. So here's an example. Let's work through an example of what a basic motion would sound like. So let's pretend we're on um, we're meeting for the organization called Impactful Organization and they are at their new fiscal year and they need to approve the budget and it was included in the board packet sent prior, a week prior to the meeting. So the chair says the next item on the agenda is the budget. I entertain a motion to approve as presented and a voting member says so move or maybe the voting member would say I move to approve the budget as presented. And then we have another voting member that would say second or support. So then the chair says it has been moved and seconded to approve the budget as presented. Any comments? And that's when you can have debate. And then again, any further comments or questions? Once everyone has had their say, 
uh, then the chair would say, all in favor of approving the budget as presented, say aye. And then usually they say all opposed, same sign, meaning if you're opposed, you also say aye. Um, again, it depends on the culture of the organization and the style of the chair. And that's, it really isn't that significant, just the key is that people are able to vote in a descending manner if they are so inclined. So now we will move into common motions and useful motions. These are ones that uh, I find most uh, frequently in meetings and then also some that I thought may be useful for uh, meetings that aren't going quite like you would l like them to. Maybe they're dragging on or someone keeps interrupting or whatnot. So common motions. One is to adjourn, obviously. You always want to adjourn your meetings. This next one, parliamentary inquiry, that basically is, you know, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, if you're being very formal, that's what you would say, and you say, I have a parliamentary inquiry, and then you would ask your question. For example, do we need to vote on the budget, or do we need to debate about adjourning? So it's basically a question about the rules of the meeting that you're conducting. And then you would have either the parliamentarian or the chair answer the question. Another motion is postpone. And that is um, where you have an item of business and it seems like the, day, the meeting is getting long and it's something that you can vote on at the next meeting. Then you can make a motion to postpone it to the next meeting. And I'm going to switch over to a chart because this will really help you um, understand um, some of the guidelines. So for example, to adjourn, someone moves to adjourn and a second is needed. So someone needs to second or support. It is not debatable and it's a majority vote. So someone says, I move to adjourn. Someone else says second. And the chair said it's been moved to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. All opposed, same sign. And that's how you adjourn. And then the parliamentary inquiry, you can see it's a little different because it is uh, you're no second, no debate, no vote. Just the chair or parliamentarian answers the questions. And then to postpone an item of business, uh, you do need a second. You can debate it, but what you're debating is if you want to postpone that item of business. You're not debating the original item of business, and it's a majority vote. You can also amend a motion. So, for example, back to our impact organization's budget, you can say, uh, I move to amend the motion by approving the budget um, as presented if, you know, I shouldn't use that as an example. That's not a great one to amend. Let's think of another one. Let's say we're building the playground and someone moves to build a new, <clears throat> excuse me, construct a new playground. Someone else can say, I move to amend the motion by adding the cost should be under $10,000. Someone else would need to support it. It is debatable. And remember, when you're debating, you're debating on the amendment, not the original motion. And it's a majority vote. And you can actually have up to two amendments. So if I amend it to 10,000, another board member may come in and say, I am moved to amend the amendment to change 10,000 to 15,000. So it, it, it can get complicated, but two is the maximum of amendments. Otherwise, it really gets crazy. Now, keep in mind, the proper way to handle amendments as a chair is you first vote on the amendment. So let's only use our one amendment that we voted, or we didn't vote. We made a motion to build a playground. Then it was amended to have a maximum cost of $10,000. So as a chair, they now say an amendment has been made. Let's vote on the amendment that we're going to add a maximum cost of $10,000. You debate on that amendment and you have a majority vote 
and let's say that passes, you still have to go back and vote on the original motion, which was to build a playground. Otherwise, all you've approved is to spend a maximum of 10000 but what are you spending a maximum of 10000 on? So you always have to work in reverse order and vote on the original until you get down to vote on the original motion. So then the chair will say, okay, now we're voting on the original motion of building a playground. Is there any debate? All those in favor say aye, etc. And then the most common motion is a main motion. And that is basically, for the most part, almost all of the type of business that you do. And whether it's voting on the playground or uh, voting to um, amend, you know, voting to approve the budget, whatever. It's your generic, almost all the time, uh, main motions are used. It does require a second. It is debatable, and <clears throat> unless your bylaws say otherwise, it's a majority vote. Now, I picked just a few motions for ones that, from experience that I've had, that um, either I wish I would have known, or I wish the chair would have known so I could have used this motion one of these motions. One is, the first one is listed, call for the orders of the day. I have no idea why they say it that way, but that's what they say. That basically means we are off track in this meeting and I want us to get back to the agenda and the original purpose of why we're here. So if you feel like a meeting is dragging too long or you're way off topic, then you can say, you know, Mr. or Madam Chairman, whatever, I call for the orders of the day. And that's all you have to say, I call for the orders of the day. Then there is no second needed, it is not debatable. The chair should say, calls for the order of the day has been moved, does anyone object? Now, if there are no objectin objections, then you immediately go back to the agenda where you're supposed to be. If someone objects, that's when you call for a vote and it has to be two thirds of a vote because you're restricting that person that, or those people that do not want to go back to the original agenda. Keep in mind in this case, you can interrupt the speaker. If there's debate going on or whatnot, and you're just, you're like, we're way off track, call for the orders of the day. Similarly is previous question. And this isn't if your day, if your whole meeting is going off track, but this is if there's an issue that is just being debated like crazy and it, you feel like you're just beating a dead horse, call for a previous question. In this case, a second is needed. And just like calls for the order of the day, you say, Mr. or Madam Chairman, I call for the previous question. And basically what that means is you have to end debate and vote right away on whatever motion is on the table. Because you're restricting other members' rights to continue to debate, it also requires a two-thirds vote. And in this case, you cannot interrupt a speaker. So in between people speaking for the debate, that's when you can call a previous question. Another useful thing, especially if you don't feel like you have all the information you need, or if time is running short and it could be better served uh, from a committee, then you can refer it to a committee. A second is needed and it is debatable. Keep in mind, you're not debating the original motion, you're debating if you want to refer it to a committee. And the vote is the majority and you want to specify as best possible what's expected of the committee. So for example, our building playground, you can say, you know, let's refer this to a committee because there's so many decisions that need to be made and so much information gathered as far as the, the types of construction we can use and this and that. So you're voting to, or you, someone moves to refer it to committee and they say, refer it to a committee of three people appointed by whoever volunteers to determine you know, where it should be located and what contractor they would recommend and that type of thing. Then when you debate, you're debating about 
if you're going to refer it to a committee of three volunteers. You're not, and you shouldn't specify, oh, and we want the swings to be green and this and that. That's what you have referred to the committee and that can be voted on at a later date. And then the last one that I find useful is sometimes you want to reconsider. Let's say you voted for something for a motion and then through the course of the meeting you've realized that, mm, you know, I don't think that was such a good decision. So you can move to reconsider and you must be on the winning side. So for example, let's say you did vote to, well actually I'll use a real life example. I was in FFA and I learned all of this during FFA um, and we had national competitions. Well one day my local advisor, he didn't feel like our local members were paying attention during a meeting. So he had the chair slip in a motion that we hire uh, we hire immigrants to sell all of our fruit and nuts as a, the fundraiser that we do. We hire them to sell them for us. And people passed it not paying attention. Sure enough, so he put the meeting to a halt and he said, do you realize what you just voted? You just voted that you're going to hire immigrants, which I have no idea where we would get them, to uh, do our fundraisers for us. He said, you've got to reconsider that motion. That was one that, yeah, someone that had voted for it, which most everyone did, um, moves, say, I move to reconsider the motion of having immigrants sell our, do our fundraisers for us. And so is it, is a second needed? Yes. Is it debatable? Yes. Only if the original motion being considered was debatable and then it's a majority vote. If, so here you're voting to reconsider and then if you reconsider, then you vote again on the original motion. So some final thoughts. Your head is probably full of things right now. So try not to uh, get discouraged, but instead focus more on the purpose of why we have Robert's Rules of Order. That it's more the purpose behind it and not the exact procedure of do I say I or do I say A and that type of thing. Really focus on the intent. The rights of the organization supersedes the rights of any individual members and all members have equal votes and rights. And you want to respect the wishes of the majority and respect the minority's right to be heard. Um, also, many parts of this, of Robert's Rules of Order, can be modified to fit the needs of an individual group. And it, you can, it could be modified by writing it into your bylaws, or it could be the norm it, of how you conduct business. And it can be very relaxed. Uh, it doesn't have to be a formal Robert's Rules of Order or formal par parliamentary procedure. The key is that everyone in the group understands and is educated on how you conduct meetings so that the top four bullet points here um, are still upheld. And again, it's really that all members have an equal vote and they have equal rights to be heard and to, to uh, go with the wishes of the majority and that the meeting is conducted efficiently. Again, remember your bylaws take precedent, so it's a great idea. I highly suggest that you have your bylaws with you during your board meetings and that keep in mind motions have ranks and I'm not going to get this deep, but for example, I used the example of um, call for the question because call for the question is one that, okay, I want to end debate and I want us to vote obviously that has precedence over the original motion that you were debating, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. So there are different types of motions and motions have ranks. You don't really need to know that today though. If you're a chair, I would encourage you to study up a bit on that and if you would like me to do a webinar of Parliamentary Procedure 201, uh, I can gladly do that. And then remember, as chairs, those of you that are chairing meetings, you do not make motions, nor do you debate. And so you are facilitating the meeting. There are instances when you vote, and we can talk about that later. Uh, these are just some of the references I used. And if you're interested in seeing some really wild, uh, interesting parliamentary procedure, you can Google parliamentary procedure and FFA and find some interesting YouTube videos of their contests.
Um, and with that, we're right at, or my clock says 12.30. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, stay tuned because we are going to do a webinar for board chairs that will cover a number of things, including some of the parliamentary procedure, but also working with your executive director, uh, working with your other board members, that type of thing. Another idea we had is, would you like a webinar um, on general meeting effectiveness? Like, if you're not a chair, how can you help the meeting be run more efficiently as a participant? So if you want general meeting effectiveness uh, information, please let us know. And one of the best ways you can let us know is to please, please, please complete your evaluation. And that will be a link in an email that you will receive from Victoria, uh, I'm guessing probably tomorrow. Nope, she's out of the office tomorrow. So at least by Thursday. Oh, it'll uh, be this really afternoon. Good. I have it 3 o'clock. That's what I'm working on. So you guys should receive it around 3 o'clock. Isn't she awesome? I was just about to say, she's usually really quick with that turnaround. It will include a copy of these slides as well for your reference, uh, but please complete the evaluation. That's how we know if we're meeting your needs or not. And with that, I will close the webinar. Thank you.